morning, everyone. Today is May 1st. This is the Education Committee. It is uh, 6.02. I am Joan Ludwig, chair of this committee. Uh, other committee members present are um, Sarah Johnson Rothman and Robert Kim. Uh, other board members present are Art Levinowitz, board president, Nita Hester, um, oh, and Mark Serrata. He was hidden. Um, I did say hello to him, though. Um, okay, so tonight we have a number of things going on, but first, is there are there any announcements or communications? There are none. So we have one presentation tonight. Um, it will be on the RTII program, and it will be Dr. Kimberly Miner. Oh, minutes. Uh, the, the March, April, wait, the March 22nd minutes uh, are online, and we should look at them and see if they're okay. Now, back to the presentation. That was me. Good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present this evening on um, response to intervention and instruction. I'd like to welcome up uh, to join me Mrs. Kathy Smythe and Mrs. Meredith Penner. Kathy Smythe uh, is an assistant principal here who is working as um, our reading leader in the elementary level. And Meredith Penner is our elementary special education supervisor. One of the um, most rewarding parts of this project to date for me personally has been getting to work with these two women. They bring tremendous expertise uh, to the work, and I'm very excited about the partnership. Before I start the presentation, I'm going to let them each just speak for a minute about why um, they have joined me in this and what their hopes are for this process. Good evening. Our RTII journey began probably two weeks after Kim got here in the district. She knew it was a priority. And the three of us meet on a, at least a monthly basis, if not every two weeks, to discuss um, what we're doing with RTII, what it would look like in the elementary schools, um, how it would benefit our children. And I know as the coordinator of reading right now with the ReadyGen program, it's really going to give students an opportunity to receive the core program, which is ReadyGen, and more. So it's the core plus more. So it is um, something that I really believe in and something that it's going to benefit all our students, whether they are in need of reading services, if they're on level, or even our advanced students. Our goal is to have every student become proficient and advanced. And if they're advanced, we're going to push them even higher. So this is a great opportunity for all of our kids to succeed. So I want to thank Kim and Kathy for just reaching out and including special education in all of these conversations. Um, as we work together to try to close the achievement gap, we're looking at a lot of our underperforming subgroups, and sometimes special education um, is one of those. We try very hard to educate all kids in their least restrictive environments, and RTI definitely aligns with that initiative. So I'm really excited to be part of this. I think it gives all kids a chance to have intervention within the general ed curriculum with a data-driven system that we can keep an eye on how they're making progress. And then it really helps from the special ed side of things for us with our child find obligation to know when a student's really struggling and when they've really had enough systematic research-based interventions to show that it is a deficit skill versus a struggle in the curriculum. Thank you both. All right, I'm going to try to get rid of this thing. Oh, I did. OK, so the first topic um, is why RTII now? And uh, you may recall that RTI existed in the district previously. In fact, it's, it's continued in some of our buildings um, to this day. So what we're really doing is um, not introducing RTI for the first time to the district, but rebooting it, revitalizing it, uh, and making sure that it's working for all of our students in the most effective way possible. 
So in terms of the timeline for why is there an urgency around doing this work at this time, on this particular slide, I have copied data from the district's elementary SPP um, report. And as you can see, we have a lot of blue triangles, some dark blue triangles, a lot of green. And what that tells us is that our district is performing well, and in fact, performing as well or better than many of our peer districts. However, there's always a flip side to good numbers, which are those students who aren't in those numbers. And so if you take an 80% achievement rate, which we have in some of our buildings, you will see that the reverse of that is that one in five elementary students in three of our schools was not reading and, or writing at a proficient level uh, at the time of the last PSSA data. One out of four third grade students in one of our schools was not reading and writing at a proficient level in third grade. In three of our schools, there was no movement towards closing the achievement gap. Um, and two of our buildings are Title I buildings, which means that there's a recognized uh, need for additional services by the federal government due to the high incidence of low-income students in those buildings. And a third of one of our buildings out of the four is in flux each year as to whether or not it qualifies for title based on that number of students who fall into the category of low so socioeconomic status. So again, while our numbers certainly uh, match our peer districts, we want to make sure that we are striving each and every day towards 100% proficiency so that every student reads at grade level. And that's what we're hoping to do in this work. The next slide is a slide taken from PVAS, which you'll recall is how we measure growth. And in this particular slide, it's a quintile diagnostic. And again, this is showing growth from the 2015 year to the 2016 year. And what you can see, if you look in the category that says highest over to the right, that for our highest students, we have struggled to show growth. Again, that is an extremely common problem with school districts across the state. It is difficult to show growth for those students who are already doing well. We hope that by providing not only interventions to our struggling readers, but enrichment opportunities through RTI to our highest readers, we're going to be able to push those numbers and show growth for all of our children. This work was envisioned before I came to the district. The cabinet, the superintendent, the school board all recognized that there was a need to continue our hard work to get from those 80%, 90% numbers to 100% so that every child is proficient in ELA. To that end, the district, when they established their superintendent and district goals in 2016, 2017, had two key elements. The first being launching the ELA program ReadyGen and my perspectives at the middle school, which we have done and continue to work diligently through the implementation of. And at the bottom highlighted is an RTI study, development, and implementation to be initiated by December 2016. And although we're not initiating RTI at this point, so we're a little behind on the timeline, you will recall that the position that I currently hold was vacated in the, in the spring of last year to early summer. And so there was a, a little bit of a delay in terms of the implementation, but we're fully on track at this point. Okay. So what is RTI? And you'll notice I keep saying RTI and I have two eyes on the screen. The reason for that is that when I was trained in RTI initially, there was only one eye. Um, since that time, the state has added a second eye. And so at the time when RTI began in this district and in many, it was response to intervention. And then there was a recognition that you needed to do more than intervene for students and look for a response to high quality instruction in the classroom. And so again, we have now, through the adoption of ReadyGen, implemented that high quality standards-based core program, that instructional piece of the two eyes. And now we're looking to supplement that and support and strengthen it through the intervention piece, the other eye. Response to intervention and instruction basically breaks down, and you probably have seen this triangle before, into three fundamental categories of support. So supports at the tier three level are for those students who are one or more years below uh, reading at grade level. And a national statistic, it tends to be about 5% of students are tier three in that tier three category. In the tier two category are students who are less than a full year below grade level in reading, and that tends to be about 15% of students. 
And then tier one are all of those students who are reading at or above grade level. And again, from a national statistic perspective, that is approximately 80% of students. We initially anticipate our numbers to be similar to those as we move forward. I think this is a, a powerful slide. The, the purpose of response to intervention is not to bring students into a standard normal distribution curve. We don't want a certain number of our students to fail and a certain number of our students to be advanced. Instead, we want to move that curve so that we're accelerating learning for all students. And you can see a graphic of this here. Uh, it's cut off a little bit, but you can see where the, uh, the line moves so that there are fewer and fewer students who are performing poorly more and more students who are performing well in terms of their achievement. So that's the ultimate goal. The process of RTI begins with identification. Is there a problem for a particular student? And then analysis. What is that problem? And then what are the goals? What do we have to do to change to solve that problem? We intervene. How will we do that? And then we assess, is that intervention working? Do we need to change something else? And that assessment piece is really critical, and it comes through progress monitoring, which I'll talk about in a minute. So what will it look like here at Upper Dublin as we revitalize it? First of all, I really want to emphasize that it will be the core plus more. We've made a major commitment to ReadyGen in this district, and we're confident that that is, is the core that will take our students where they need to go. Uh, in terms of a core program. But RTI offers the opportunity to add enrichment for growth for those students that we saw at those upper quintiles, and intervention for growth for those students who are struggling right now to access ReadyGen to its fullest. There have been some questions about why at this time not move forward with RTI I for math. And again, at this time, we have a very strong program in Eureka. It's standards aligned. And it does all of those pieces that we need it to do for math. But fundamental to success in math as well, beyond the mathematics par portion, is comprehension skills. Students must understand what a question is asking of them in order to tackle it successfully. And we believe that by having a strong RTII model in reading, we will support success in math as students gain those comprehension skills. The leadership of the program at the district level, as I mentioned earlier, is Kathy and Meredith and I working together to make sure that we deliver a service model that is the same in all of our buildings in terms of data collection, data analysis, um, and the protocols that go along with that. At the building level, the, the initiative will be led by principals and reading specialists. The interventions will take place for 30 minutes each day for all students in grades K through 5. And at tier one, it will be staffed by our general education teachers. At tier two, it will be a combination of general education teachers and reading specialists. And at tier three, it will be primarily reading specialists, and sometimes we'll be able to utilize special education teachers in that as well. Again, moving us towards that place where all of our staff educates all of our children, um, and there's less of a divide between those two worlds of regular and special education. The resources that we have proposed for these interventions are at Tier 1 Junior Great Books, at Tier 2 Faunus and Pinnell Text Types, and at Tier 3 Faunus and Pinnell Leveled Literacy Intervention. I would like to say a few words about how we got to these resources. So these resources were proposed. Uh, they went to the liter Literacy Council in the district, which is representatives from uh, all of the different buildings and different grade levels and reading specialists along with administrators. And those resources were <laughs> vetted so that um, each of the different resources samples went out to teachers, and teachers were encouraged to provide feedback back and forth over the course of several months. So we're pleased to say that the Literacy Council has endorsed the adoption of all three of these as our primary uh, interventions at each tier. The data sources that we'll be using for screening and progress monitoring the primary source will be STAR. As you know, that was a new addition to the district this year. Um, we are very excited by the data that it is producing, and it will allow us to get uh, excellent universal screenings of our students. It also has the capability of allowing us to progress monitor. We will still keep tools like Dibbles, RAS, uh, F&P, other items along those lines that we can use for additional diagnostics for students as teachers and reading specialists and leadership deems necessary. This is an example of a STAR screening report. 
Um, I would like to say that in both this slide and the following slide, you'll see that there are student names. These are uh, student names made up by STAR. They're from the web. They're, they're not uh, Upper Dublin students, so please don't be concerned that um, we're divulging student inter inter information Excuse me, with these screens. As you can see, uh, when a screening report is given, all students um, are color-coded in terms of students who are above grade level expectations in green, meeting grade level expectations in blue, students who are in need of intervention in yellow, and students who are in need of urgent intervention in red. So this ability to analyze and look at our data systematically will be uh, incredibly important as we move forward. This same program, STAR, allows us to progress monitor our students uh, who are our struggling readers. We will keep a very close eye on them because we recognize that the window to get students reading um, is widest open between grades K and three. And so it's critical to do that work. It continues to be open, of course, throughout their school career. But we want to make sure that week by week we're monitoring and making sure we're doing everything we can uh, to have those students be successful. So in this progress monitoring graph, when an intervention is introduced, it drops a red line. Then students in tier three will get monitored weekly and we'll look for trends. And if we need to change an intervention to meet student needs, we will do that. Students in tier two will be progress monitored bi-weekly. And tier one students, because they're reading at or above grade level, will not be progress monitored on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, but instead we'll look at them through three screenings in the year, September, January, February, and then May. My final slide is just uh, giving credit to some of the great minds in the world of RTI. Many of these slides were derived from their work, uh, and uh, they have been an inspiration and a source of resource for our work here at Upper Dublin. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Kim. Yep. Um, comments or questions from the committee? Thanks. Um, Okay, so a couple of things. I know, um, Kim, you had said that we have RTII in some of our buildings, or at least one of our buildings. Can you um, just give me a little explanation or background there? Sure, I can. Um, so I, I want to say about nine years ago when RTI was, you know, really um, becoming uh, important in education, Upper Dublin did begin that work, and in fact, uh, Mr. Sigafus was um, principal at Maple Glen, and I believe they went to a state presentation on the topic. And so the district was extremely invested. RTI is um, somewhat labor intensive in terms of the need for uh, systematic data analysis, protocols, those sorts of things. It also really requires um, that staff be well resourced. And I'm not certain that at the initiation we had as, as rich of a resource base as it would have been. Um, desired at that time. So over time, as leadership changed, um, that changed building to building. At this point, Maple Glen still functions with an RTI model. Uh, Jarrett Town last year had an RTI model. This year, with the implementation of ReadyGen, they moved away from that. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the timeline on uh, for Thomas uh, Fitzwater and Fort Washington, although I believe that Fort Washington had it and I think Thomas fits as well as recently as um, two years ago. So it, it was it was relatively recent development. I think the big difference now in terms of the success will be consistent district wide leadership, the investment in all of the resources that are necessary, and and really the adoption um, that we did previously this year of that star tool to collect data and to progress monitor students. The efficiency and effectiveness of that tool will really be a cornerstone that the district never had access to before. Um, the fact that Maple Glen has RTII and has had it um, and maybe hasn't been well resourced over the last few years, but has had um, have we seen our kids at Maple Glen doing better in reading or ELA than our other schools? So uh, there has been consistently high scores in Maple Glen uh, in ELA. It's difficult to say if that's completely a function of RTI or demographics or schedule or you know any of those sorts of things it's really hard to parse that out but they have continuously performed at a, at a higher rate overall than the other buildings in terms of strictly achievement for students but again i can't say what what what, what accounts for that yeah and 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 pivas growth as well uh, you know of course we saw great growth from thomas fitzwater this year so there's there's 
there's strength in all of our schools. I think there's just a recognition that doing this will bolster and make sure that we're not missing any of those kids. That, that difference between 85% achievement and, and 100% and why I wanted to kind of call those numbers out that way is I feel, you know, and I think all of our principals and staff do, those are real children, not just numbers. And so we want to get to 100. Uh, I have a couple questions. One is, uh, I know through this year of implementing ReadyGen, um, the initial PD was not what we had expected. Um, so, and and some teachers have, have voiced their concerns about whether they really feel like they know ReadyGen and know all the resources. So, what are we doing? This may be a question as much for Kathy as for you, Kim. Um, in terms of summer curriculum planning to develop the resources we need to help teachers who still don't feel quite comfortable with ReadyGen. Sure, I can let Kathy answer that. Absolutely, as we went on the journey in ReadyGen, we realized that um, teachers kept asking for ReadyGen um, professional development. And as you said, the first two times that we had it from, the, um, from Pearson, it was not up to par for our teachers because a lot of the information they gave us was something that they had already experienced. So what we've done is um, we've put together a draft of summer curriculum work that we're going to be working on looking at the assessments that they, they provided for us that they feel as if there's not enough time to put into. There's too much grading to be involved. So we're, we're looking at each grade level and each unit and each module and um, we're going to have teachers come in and take a look at their um, what they're doing. We're giving them observational checklists. We're give, we're providing um, some writing. We're looking at writing samples from the from the district because when we looked at ReadyGen's um, exemplars, they were not up to the upper Dublin standards. What they considered a high score was not what our students were producing. They were producing much more than that. So we want to take a look and see what our students how they've done in the first year. And um, there's a lot of rigor in ReadyGen, and I think that was part of the issue with, the, uh, with, with some of the teachers and with the students, because they're not used to having, um, having a shared reading that might be a year to a year and a half above grade level. So it's a shift that we've had, but the good news with ReadyGen was, now there's a book in every student's hand. Before they had a textbook with just little exemplars of stories. This, now with ReadyGen, they can read, um, really quality literature and shared reading, and they have the opportunity to read many, many texts. So we're gonna be going through those as well because the teachers have asked, uh, what, what type of support materials can we use? So we're gonna be working with them, uh, with a group of teachers. Um, probably, we're looking at probably 15 to 18 days of, of, of writing curriculum for the, for, um, the grades K to five. So, can I just add one thing yeah. to that, Joan? Um, so there is, um, and I think over the course of the year with conversations with teachers, a realization that there's two different pieces in terms of the implementation of ReadyGen. One is curriculum work that we need to do here. And I think that's what Kathy was speaking about. I know that's what mm -hmm. Kathy was speaking about in terms of the summer. The other is professional development, which is separate from curriculum work. Mm -hmm. And so we, we did have you know a couple less than stellar PD uh, moments in the fall. We were able to bring in a better trainer in the spring. The other thing that I'm really excited about is we have started to differentiate our professional development for our teachers around reading instruction. So we recognize that different teachers are in different places in terms of their comfort level with just reading instruction generally, um, which impacts their ability to deliver uh, ReadyGen. And so we are meeting those needs by providing a menu of professional development opportunities that teachers can really take those that b best suit their learning needs as individuals as well. So I think that's moving in a, in a very positive direction. And the other thing that we're really stressing now is guided reading. Teachers came and we listened to them. They want more PD on guided reading, the good instruction that comes with the resources. ReadyGen's just a resource, but we want to professionally develop teachers and expand their knowledge through good reading practices and Fontes and Pinnell and through guided reading as it has that ability to do that. Uh, one of my other questions has to do with 
staffing for RTII. So, I mean, everyone says that a program like this is only a, works if there is appropriate staffing level. And it may be that some of the schools that have fallen away from the practice, that it was probably, no, many of the principals are here, they could speak and tell me if I'm correct about this, that some of it had to do with not being able to, to staff the, f the full program. Mm -hmm. um, so are you, how, how is it gonna be staffed and will it be what is really needed to make the program work? So I would say that there's no administrator on the universe who's gonna tell you they have as many staff as they'd like, right? I mean, we all would like small class sizes. We would all, so, so there's a difference between uh, ideal and, um, and what we need to make it work effectively. And so what we need to make work effectively, I'm confident that we have. In fact, I've taken the opportunity to sit down with principals, go through our current data, and you know, back of the envelope math in terms of what we will need. The other thing that is really um, exciting that we have as an opportunity this year is the ability to kind of have a crystal ball look at next fall through the STAR assessment that we can give this May. So we have a STAR screening window open right now. It will close May 12th. May 15th, I will sit down with the principals, with Kathy, with Meredith, and we will predict where there will be hot spots in the district, you know, third grade at Fort or second grade at Jarrettown. By being able to predict that in advance, we can work with Meredith, for instance, on is there a special education teacher that we could free up at that time of the day to provide an additional support classroom. So having that first look is something that we never really had before. So I'm very confident that with our existing staff, plus that ability to plan so far in advance, not that we won't rescreen, we will, but it will give us at least a sense of where the numbers are going, um, that, that we will be able to run these interventions um, quite successfully. Would we like more staff? Always more staff is, 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 is delightful. I mean, I, I know we talked about instructional support specialists mm -hmm. some during this year, and right. the answer I remember was, you know, it would be much easier if we had them, but yes. that we could make the program work without that. Right, so the instructional specialist positions that we had moved uh, forward for consideration earlier in the year were to serve a variety of functions, including support in math, um, to yeah serve as kind of laboratory classrooms where they would push into classrooms or work with small groups of students so that other teachers could observe and learn from their work. So certainly having those positions would make the math easier on RTI, there's no question. More bodies ma ma makes the math easier. But again, we have worked through the numbers and we're confident that we can run RTI successfully. We can't do those other pieces, that academic coaching, those math interventions that we would like to do, but we can successfully run RTI this year or next year. Um, my concern with some of this is, I mean, I think that RTI is great. Um, when my son was in kindergarten, we had it then, and then he didn't have it after that. Um, so that's my grand experience with it. Um, but uh, one of the issue, one of the concerns that I have is that we have Ready Gen, and this is its first year, and this isn't. Um, it's implementation. We've had some struggles because we didn't have the best trainers in the fall and things like that. Um, and I would love to see this program as done as soon as possible. I just want to make sure we're ready for it, right? That our teachers aren't overextended, that, um, you know, that they're working still on the ready gen and then we're putting something in the mix, plus, you know, Eureka in there. So that, that's my one, my concern is that, um, are, we, are we really ready for it? And how do we know we're ready for it? Well, that, that's a great question. Um, again, I would kind of answer the same way, which is, um, it may be five or ten years before there's some people who are completely comfortable with ReadyGen, right? So there, there could be an unlimited amount of time for that. Um, that being said, the interventions that we took through the Literacy Council specific for, specifically for that reason, for teachers to hold them in their hands, to look at them, to determine whether or not they would be uh, things that they could use effectively next year. The feedback that we got was, was excellent on those. Junior Great Books has actually been used in this district for many, many years. I don't know how many, but I would guess over a decade in different pockets. So a lot of our teachers are already familiar with that. There's a new edition now, it's much better, but they know that resource and they're comfortable with that resource. 
Um, text types as a, a tier two resource is simply just a collection of guided reading books so that students get a second opportunity to do guided reading beyond what they're doing in ReadyGen. So again, our teachers are trained in that through ReadyGen. It's, it's functionally the same thing. LLI is our most intensive intervention. It requires the highest level of training. And in fact, the board um, had voted at a previous meeting to, to provide that training in June. The people who will be trained in that that is a big investment of time. Those people are reading specialists and then teachers who have volunteered. And actually, we have over 20 teachers in each of those um, trainings, inc inclusive of our reading specialists and special ed teachers, who have stepped up and said, I want to learn this. I think this is really valuable. So there's no teacher that has to participate in that unless they self-select. So in that sense, I'm really confident about it. The other thing, other two things I would say is, number one, I always struggle with the tension between you're only a first grader once, you're only a kindergartner once, and if we wait always for the grown-ups to catch up, those kids don't get that opportunity to be first graders again, to be kindergartners again. And when we're talking about the difference between learning to read and not, the stakes are really high. Um, so that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is as students are supported by their reading specialist in a tier three intervention and then coming back into the classroom for ready gen. That will ease the burden somewhat on teachers because they know that the, their children are getting these really effective interventions and very quickly will be able to be more successful with those ready gen materials and in those ready gen lessons. So I do think that it will end up being a very strong support very quickly to what we're doing in ready gen. So we started the presentation with understanding that we desire to close the achieving, achievement gap. Um, in what ways or what, what data or presentation research has shown that RTII has been effective in doing that? And if so, do you have uh, maybe neighboring or peer districts that have implemented RTII to do so? Um, so the four gentlemen that I included at the end of the presentation, they have done uh, a lot of uh, research on RTI. In particular, my, my pers the person who I've personally spent the most time with at state trainings is uh, the late Ed Shapiro out of Lehigh University. If you're interested in any of his research studies, I would, I would direct you there. In terms of um, the research on the individual interventions, there are several white papers particularly written on LLI and the ability of LLI to close the achievement gap for special education students, general education students, and English language learners. And, and again, if you are interested at the Faunus and Pinnell website under Leveled Literacy Intervention, there's some excellent white papers on that. In terms of surrounding districts who have used RTI effectively, um, the ones that I'm most familiar with are the ones that I have worked at personally. Um, the, in Park Yeoman Valley School District in Evergreen Elementary, where I was principal, we saw a tremendous closure of the achievement gap uh, to the point of not having a, an end size of 40 special education students in a building of over 700 students in a four-year time span, um, which is pretty remarkable. And in fact, the state came in uh, initially to audit us as a potential child find problem and then ultimately to commend us for the success of RTI. So I can speak from personal experience um, about that. I also have a question a little bit about the timeline. Um, I know when we were, a couple of things I remember from the couple meetings when we were selecting ReadyGen, that there was some discussion at that time that there were some holes that needed to be filled that we knew that was coming, that this wasn't something that came up in the middle of this year. Um, I'm not sure who's the best person to answer that. I, I can speak to that as well. I think the primary pre-identified potential concern with ReadyGen was the phonics and phonemic awareness portion in grades K and 1. I will say that that is a common um, issue with comprehensive reading programs um, in neighboring districts, for instance, who have adopted Reading Wonders, um, which is another program that the district may have gone down the path of, they have also found the need to supplement in K and 1. Um, phonics, phonemic awareness, those early alphabetic principle skills are, are very unique um, in terms of best being served by direct instruction, like a program like Foundations. ReadyGen seeks to be, and is very much so, an excellent program in terms of building comprehension skills, writing skills, those kinds of pieces. You know, as much as textbook um, companies would like to say that 
all of their products do everything, right? Because that's how they sell them to Texas and New York. You know, it does everything. There's always some areas where there's a greater strength and, and some areas that are a weakness. And, and so this was an obvious weakness out of the gate as it would have been with almost any other program that we adopted. And so there was an early recognition. And so the, the solution to that is the adoption of foundations in K-1 this year and in second grade the following year. And foundations is based on the work of Barbara Wilson. You may have heard of Wilson um, in terms of special education interventions. And it's really the highest quality um, program available anywhere, I think, in terms of getting those foundational skills locked down. Do any other members of the board have questions? Or? So I was going to ask about foundations, but I'm not clear. The piece I'm not clear, I guess, on is, is that part of RTII or is that a separate, I don't want to use the word intervention because it's No, it's not an intervention. It's part of the core. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's, se it's separate. And in, in what will happen is that the pieces of, of phonics that were included in the ReadyGen program that are not as robust as we believe they should be. We'll, we will actually no longer use those and we will use foundations in its place. At the same time, we were using Zaner Blozer for our, write, our handwriting instruction, how to print. We will stop using Zaner Blozer. We will not purchase that anymore and foundations will uh, take that part in our core as well. So you, if you have a kindergarten student, a first grade student, they'll talk about drawing up to the plane line and down to the worm line. So that whole, that whole piece of foundations will come right into the core. So it will be for every student grade K and one. It has a similar function though, by, by making sure that all of our kids at the very earliest ages have such a strong program, we hope that it will ward off the need for interventions at later grades. Thank you. Any other? Some questions about the assessment. Uh, the assessment that we're going to do in May this year, you said, is that that stars? Yes, star. Mm -hmm. And how star? Mm -hmm. How long does that take to administer? The the star uh, assessment has three parts. It has star early literacy, which is for kindergarten, and it looks at both literacy and numeracy. It takes approximately eighteen minutes in terms of the administration. Is that kindergarten? When they're in kindergarten or? Right, it's kindergarten in? when they're in kindergarten, they're in kindergarten and the beginning of first grade. Okay. And then there's star reading and star math. Each of those assessments, assessments also takes approximately 18 minutes. It varies by student between 15 and 20, but approximately 18 minutes. So in this uh, May screening, we'll be giving early literacy to the kindergartners, reading and math to grades one through five um, for a total of about 36 minutes in grades one through five. Is it? done online or is it a Right, so when we adopted STAR um, uh, back in January, STAR is a computer adaptive assessment so that um, it allows us to see how a student is performing uh, and if they're performing well below or well above grade level by each time a student answers a question, changing the next question in response. Mm -hmm. So that if they get it correct, they get a more difficult question. If they get it incorrect, they get an easier question. Mm -hmm. So it allows us from a child find perspective even to identify potentially gifted students who show up reading or, or doing math way above grade level or students who are struggling more than we imagined. It also, on a very granular level, breaks down the specific skills. And so from an intervention perspective, to know very specifically where a child is struggling, um, it's very useful. I would say that if I was uh, sitting in the audience or at home watching this, I would say, how can a test do that in 18 minutes? That seems like it should take forever. The PSSAs take forever. Um, so again, I would uh, suggest that anybody who's interested go to um, the Renaissance website. And again, there's excellent research studies on the effectiveness of STAR as a screening tool and a progress monitoring, monitoring tool. There's also a website called RTI for Success, I believe, .org, but I would just Google RTI for Success, where they analyze um, dozens and do dozens of different screening tools of all kinds, including Dibbles um, and STAR. And they uh, rate them in terms of their reliability and validity. And STAR gets outstanding uh, scores in both of those categories, despite its short uh, time for administration. Good. Maybe they should use that for the PSSAs. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the progress monitoring that, that is done Every week, I think you said something. For tier three students, yes. Yeah, and so is that 
the 18 minutes or is yes, that a piece Yes, that's of the 18 minutes. So one of the reasons that we were uh, excited about adopting STAR is it's one of the few tools that has excellent research supporting it as both a screener and a progress monitor. So the experience for students is the same in terms of what the assessment looks like when they sit down to take it. Mm -hmm. That being said, there's a bank of thousands of questions, so the students never encounter the same questions on two subsequent administrations, but it becomes very familiar for the students. Um, actually, we, we were interested when we first rolled it out how students would respond to my knowledge in the entire district. Um, we had one child who, uh, you know, had some tears because they couldn't get their computer to, to work properly. But for the most part, our kids actually enjoy the assessment. It's, it's a very kid-friendly assessment, particularly the early literacy. It's kind of cartoonish. Um, and so the feedback from teachers has been great in terms of students using that. So, the, so uh, for kindergarten, what, what device are we using? So they're that. using the, the, the Chromebooks, the touch Chromebooks right. that okay. Philip has provided them with. Right. The, one of the things that's great about the program is mm -hmm. it actually, and I'm not a tech person, I'm sure Philip knows exactly how this happens, but it knows whether you have a touch screen or not a touch screen, okay. and it actually changes the directions and how to right. use it so our kids can just go ahead and touch, and it's super user right. friendly in that regard. And how, how do we keep track of the, is there a student ID number yes. that's not? Their social security. That's that, correct. That they use their their district student ID number, mm -hmm. and then we have, and then the data is historical, and so we can actually use this data for growth over the course of many years. It's been particularly useful in core team meetings when we're looking at uh, students for special education, um, because it has all of those component parts. The uh, just the RTII for math. I, I was wondering if other districts. Uh, do RTII for math? Yes, there, just... there, are, there are districts who do RTII for reading, and there are districts who do it for math, and there are districts who do it for behavior. All of those th three things okay. are um, opportunities. It also, um, I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, it was RTI, now it's RTII. There's also MTSS, which is multi-tiered systems of support, which is really in the same family, but kind of the newest name for all of these kind of looking at tiers and offering different uh, levels of support. So I'm not aware of any districts in our immediate vicinity who do it for math, but it is done across the nation. Okay. One, more, one more question, if I may. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how this will look. Uh, it's, it's a half hour every day. Yes. Well, at least you, we try to do it a half hour every day. Yes. Uh, there's 22 to 24 classes in each of our elementary schools. Yes. So then I would assume that they are not, they're happening throughout the day. Correct. So they, so part of um, what we're looking at very carefully, uh, parallel to this as we look at the elementary schedule, is the ability to have our reading specialists be available to provide tier three support in mm -hmm. every single grade level. <laughs> and in addition to that, have their schedule work in such a way that they're available during the ELA blocks of classroom time so that they can push in and support students in small group in ReadyGen. And so having our reading specialists be able to use their time to its maximum, they are, they are our experts and we want to get as much functionality out of them as possible. So yes, each grade level would run at a different time. So let me just ask, if we, if we take uh, Thomas Fitzwater, how many reading specialists? Two. So is this going to totally change or significantly change what they're currently doing? Still so it, I, I would say it changes what they're currently doing. Some of the reading specialists in our district have, <laughs> have LLI materials currently. And again, that's one of the programs that was piecemeal in the district before some individual kits had been purchased. Our reading specialists had not gone through the three-day training mm -hmm. um, that is intensive, and so they're not able to utilize it as, as effectively as they would like. So some of them are pulling it right now. Um, some of them are using programs which, in which they have been trained, like foundations. Actually, they're using it. There's an intervention piece. They're using that intervention piece. Um, they're using other interventions like Read Naturally, those sorts of things. So our reading specialists as a collective are excited. They recognize that LLI is, is the best thing on the market. Well, currently, do the children go to the reading Yes, specialist? they get pulled at a variety of different times right. of now, the day. Now, this model? It streamlines that and makes it a systematic approach to those pullouts so that every child who needs 
a tier three intervention needs time with a reading specialist will get time with a reading specialist. And, and I will even go a step further. The LLI intervention is a four to one student teacher ratio. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that it is very, very intensive. And in order to maintain the integrity of that intervention and its research base, you need to have four or fewer students. So again, in working with the principals, looking across the grade levels, there were not very many grade levels that had more than eight students who we would consider of need of an urgent intervention. Right. Because we are training voluntarily additional regular ed teachers for this program and special education teachers, if we find those hot spots, we can tap into them because they will have gone through the training. Right. So with the RTII, with that group three? Is, is Tier the, three, yes. Okay. Uh, they still would go to the reading specialist? During the RTI During time. the RTI mm -hmm. period. Yes. And the other two groups would remain in the classroom? They will go based on their need for intervention. So the students who need a tier two intervention, that's a, that's a right. one to six student teacher ratio. Okay. So they will go and, and receive that. And then the students who remain, because one of their teachers at least will be out doing a tier two, they will be kind of reshuffled into those tier one groups at that period of time. So people aren't necessarily staying. They may have their classroom teacher or they may not, depending on how the numbers work out. And I want to be really clear, we're not presupposing the data. It's going to be student driven real time. So whatever an individual student needs, we're going to provide that. So at some grade levels, we may have three tier three sections. At others, we may have zero. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be something that we look at every, um, there'll be two 12 week sessions each year. So we'll look at that each time. Um, and again, I think it's one of the reasons why it was difficult to sustain without a really strong data tool like we now have. Star. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any, okay, Mark? Um, do you envision, so at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about um, in addition to reaching those who need intervention the most, um, to uh, making sure that the those who are gifted also are, are pushed appropriately. Do you right. envision the RTI implementation to be a component of that, or is this? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the Junior Great Books um, Tier 1 intervention is actually part of the history of it in the district was that it was used by gifted teachers and gifted classrooms. And, and that is sometimes how it is used uh, throughout districts, because it is extremely high quality, often classic pieces of literature with very challenging vocabulary. And it focuses on inquiry. So it's student-led conversations. Really, the teacher is trained to, to, to be quiet while students uh, question one another. They learn to question each other's ideas, not make personal attacks, which is an important skill, as we all know. Um, and so it really takes that to the next level. And so I, I believe that for our gifted students, and as you know, I'm, I'm also responsible for them as part of my title directly, um, I think that that will be, and for our, our students who are at grade level, um, I'm going to be giving a presentation on gifted at the next education committee. And to give you a little sneak preview, one of the things we're going to talk about is the need to have those enriching, challenging experiences for students who may or may not have a GIAP but are academically ready. And so I believe that Junior Great Books will push all of those kids who are reading at or above grade level. And in fact, in the, in the Tier 1, we have some opportunity to, because of the data, to cluster students who have similar, let's say, oral reading rates together so that kids are moving at the same pace. You know, we may want to have students who um, are very, uh, very easily able to talk in a group and challenge one another group together so they don't dominate the students who really need to work on and develop that skill. So we'll be looking at that really carefully. And I do think, uh, and again, from my own personal experience, I saw PVOS growth in both Phoenixville and in um, Perkyoman Valley when we implemented junior grade books for those high level students. I think one of the critical critical mistakes districts make with RTI is they forget to do something for that 80%, which is a huge number of kids. And so teachers kind of do piecemeal things to fill the time by doing something very, very intentional that will help all kids grow. I think we'll we'll see that success. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the presentation and for a lot of information which really helps us understand the program, the need for the program, and how it's going to be implemented. It was my, my pleasure. Okay, moving on to the next part of our meeting. We have a number of items. The first one is uh, the one that's always there for information, the enrollment report. Uh, our next item is 
uh, the Sandy Run schedule. Um, who is going to speak to what the status is? Thank you. Um, very briefly, we have started having some very initial conversations about what a project may look like moving forward. We have had um, some surveys done of the existing um, Sandy Run um, area where the building uh, property, where the building we're, is. We're talking about the schedule. Oh, I the schedule. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, it's fine if you want to talk about the building. Oh, uh, that's what me, the topic let finish, is. Let me finish then. Yeah. My mistake and my enthusiasm to share this information. Um, we've had some preliminary surveys done. We now know where the, uh, the new flood lines that were drawn recently are on that property. We also know where all of the underground utilities are. No decisions have been made. We've just been really trying to understand where we are now so that we can then make decisions moving forward. We know that whatever happens, we will have a 6th, 7th, and 8th grade building and um, continuing to get organized with what we will have to do to explore that moving forward. Thank you for indulging me. Hey, thank you. Who would like to speak to the Sandy Run schedule? I think Mrs. Morrison probably is the person. I think the purpose of putting it on is to memorialize the conversation had at the last Finance Committee, and I was under the impression that that would uh, be an update from the I board. guess I, I could speak to that, actually, because um, at the Finance <laughs> Committee meeting, we decided, and we, we had some discussion about whether there was, if anyone remembers, there was option A and option B. One of the options was to Changed the schedule over a two-year period. Mostly it had to do with uh, staffing. Um, and the uh, Finance Committee and then the board as a whole really decided that we wanted to move forward with, I believe it's option A, which was implementing the full schedule changes next year. And that has been rolled into the budget right now. So the budget final decision on the budget won't be until June, but everything going forward, and I am pretty confident saying the preliminary final budget will have the staffing in it to implement the Sandy Run schedule as it was presented in the option A. Any questions about that? Could I? I there were some um, curriculum related items that came out of the then your unscheduled process uh, to be determined in the future, um, like how we're going to use uh, the advisory period uh, and some proposals around that for the future, um, and questions around um, electives for eighth grade. Um, has there been any progress on any of that, or when, should, when do we expect to, to see progress on any of that? Yeah, so for in terms of thinking about how we can support students during the advisory period, um, we are planning on moving forward with an online platform called Branching Minds that helps assist teams with personalizing interventions. It um, suggests, based on a brief teacher and um, soon student survey, as well as STAR data that we're implementing <laughs> at the secondary level, it will suggest intervention, personalized intervention programs for students and give teams the ability to track um, uh, student success. So we are going to um, have branching minds at the middle school as well as in grades 9 and 10 for the same purposes. In terms of the music schedule, um, I know that Dr. Clark and Mr. Albert continue to look at the X period as a means, and I think we've described that in the past as a means to allow students who don't select one of the ensembles in eighth grade to continue to partake in that. Um, and I just wanted to, just as an added plus, on behalf of our scheduling committee, we submitted a presentation. There's a national meeting in Philadelphia of the American mid-level educators and our presentation has been accepted um, for their speed learning round 
and is now under consideration for a pull-on presentation. I think we named, we called the presentation um, developing a middle school schedule that is future ready. And just to clarify, yes, at this point, the budget um, that is being proposed and considered does include three positions for Sandy Run, one for sixth grade to allow us to provide an accelerated, dedicated accelerated math course for sixth grade without those students having to move up into seventh grade classrooms, and two additional positions for eighth grade, which will allow us to run an extra team. So at this point, those are in the budget. Okay, um, the next item on our agenda is an update on the process for revising elementary schedules. Okay, um, we had our most recent meeting uh, an hour ago, and uh, we have two more meetings uh, scheduled before May 30th when I hope to come before the board with a presentation um, on the schedule. The uh, process has been a really exciting one. We have um, drafted and redrafted the schedule based on feedback um, from teachers, uh, reading specialists, administrators, um, and, and parents throughout the district. In fact, tonight we um, just um, removed the last draft and put forward a new revised draft based on um, that feedback and input. We are collecting it uh, in a Google document and then uh, seeking to revise the schedule uh, based on that feedback as we move through. At this point, um, I will continue throughout May to go to all of the grade level meetings in the district and the faculty meetings in the district um, to continue to solicit that feedback. And in addition, we have teacher representatives from a variety of grades in all of the buildings, as well as administrative representatives on the committee. In terms of our ability to get input from parents, we have had uh, a coffee at Fort Washington right at the beginning of the process. We had another one at uh, Jarrett Town, and then um, we most recently had one at Maple Glen. There are two more scheduled for May. We're going to go to Thomas Fitz. Um, on May 16th, and we're going to go, excuse me, May 24th, and we're going to go to Fort Washington on May 16th. So because <laughs> Fort was seen at the very beginning of the process, we're going to stop there again as we near the end of the process. Um, all parents in the district of elementary students are invited to attend coffees at either of those schools, even if their children uh, go to one of the other two elementary schools. Um, I would like to uh, address one thing that came up from parent feedback this evening, which is messaging around why uh, we are looking at the elementary schedules. Why are we doing this work now? And the principals at the committee reminded us that they, in fact, alter the elementary schedule as a, as a matter of course every year. And so this is, a, this is a common occurrence. It's just that now we're trying to be more systematic and purposeful in terms of our time across the district with a couple of, of main priorities. Number one is to make sure that all students have <coughs> equal access to the resource of time in the content areas across the district. Number two, the district made major financial and philosophical investments in programs like ReadyGen and Eureka and the work that uh, Mrs. Small has done with teachers on developing the science curriculum over the past few years, and we want to make sure that teachers have the time to teach those programs effectively. And then we also want to make sure that we have time in the schedule to support the district goal of uh, having RTI run in all of our buildings. So that's why we're looking at doing it now. Our goal is not to uh, make all of the buildings exactly the same. We want to support individual school culture but we recognize that the right to learn and time as a resource being an important part of that should be distributed equally uh, in all of our schools. And then one just more practical reason that we're looking at it is that we do share a number of staff members, and so we want to make sure that that, that shared staffing aligns. And then finally, we have um, people like Mrs. Small who support in science, Leah Howard who supports in math, Kathy Smythe who supports in reading, and their ability to schedule and identify when they can support across the district 
uh, because there are defined times for the subject areas in which they support will be enhanced by moving forward with the schedule. That's my update. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we will have a complete presentation at the May 30th meeting on this. That is correct, correct, as well as a presentation on the findings of the Gifted Review Committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, any comments or questions on the elementary schedule? Okay, let's move on. The next item is the partnership with Drexel University. So we're excited, Mr. Vinogradov and I are excited to announce that we have an opportunity for Upper Dublin students. They, um, through the Close School of Entrepreneurship, which is a relatively new college in, at Drexel University, we are this summer going to be able to offer students the Cornerstone course. Um, students in, uh, for rising 10th and 11th graders will be able, free of charge, to enroll in the course, which will be taught on our campus. Um, and Mr. Vinogradov and I will be teaching that course, we'll be co-teaching it. One of the reasons we're particularly excited about this partnership is that um, through this Cornerstone course, skills that are necessary for students moving forward into the 21st century are identified, and those skills are practiced by the students. So it's something we want to closely understand what CLOSE is doing, no pun intended, so that we can also start thinking about ways we can infuse those skills into our curriculum. Um, there will be an agreement um, and a motion for next week. The agreement will be subject, of course, to solicitor uh, review. Mr. Vinogradov, do you want to add anything? No, that was great. I heard a rumor that the two of you are going to be providing this, teaching this course at no cost. And I want to thank you for your willingness to, and in enthusiasm in bringing this to Upper Dublin, that you're willing to do it without pay, which is amazing. Um, it, this is a community of learners. Um, and so either we were going to teach the class or we were going to take the class. So. Um, you know, one great way to get access to a really awesome curriculum is to say, I'm, I'll do it. Uh, yeah. I think we said that at the same time, so it was an opportunity to collaborate and, right. and bring that to the kids. All right. Well, and, thank you. And potentially faculty as well. Um, if we have spaces, we would love to have some of our faculty join, um, just because we're so excited about the ideas in this course. This, this was something that, uh, you know, many of us have worked on during the school year, and, and we'd like to thank... Uh, somebody who's worked with the district before, which is Stan Silverman, who, who brought this uh, potential uh, to the district, and then, the, then we, we followed up and worked with the uh, School of Entrepreneurship at, at Drexel. And, and I just wanted to thank the administration, and especially, again, for Phil and, and Ava for, for doing this. Uh, I'm always concerned about stuff, something. So my, my concern with this is uh, we got to get the publicity out. We have to make sure that we have enough uh, young men and women taking this class, because I think it would be a, be a shame if, if we don't get the numbers. The turnaround on this is faster than we would have liked. Right. Um, and we will, Mr. V has been working on publicity, and we have sent out listservs, um, and we've uh, been in contact with all rising 10th and 11th graders. This is not hopefully going to be the only opportunity. This is an opportunity, and we certainly encourage um, anyone with students in, uh, who are rising 10th and 11th graders. The deadline for application submission is May 8th, and we do have a quick turnaround. We will help support students with that turnaround as much as we possibly can, and are looking forward to a continued part partnership in the future with Drexel around this. Is it on our website? Is it on the front? front? Yep. No, we can, but we can put it there. Uh, any other comments or questions about that? Okay. Let's move on to prof the professional development with the Bucks County IU. So Dr. Wheeler has implemented um, professional development for administrators and aspiring administrators. I think many people in this room um, took part in the first cohort, which was 
very strong and very positive, so much so that there's a second cohort, and I think Dr. Wheeler can speak to that. Yes, this is a certificate program offered through Penn. It is known as Dynamic Leadership, and or Leadership Dynamics. Um, we had one cadre of 20 administrators and teacher leaders participate in the fall. We're launching a second cohort that will begin next week. And uh, we again have 20 additional administrators and teachers who have expressed an interest. Uh, we're very excited about it. This is really going to strengthen our ability to have those common conversations and to share ideas about leadership as we work together. I think it was Phil who mentioned a few minutes ago that we have a team approach. And we really are a learning community and a learning team. So partnering with uh, teachers and administrators to develop ourselves and expand our repertoire and expertise is, um, is invaluable. So thank you again to the board for, um, for sponsoring this second cohort of uh, Leadership Dynamics. Any comments or questions about that? How big was the first cohort? Um, 20 as well? OK, so after this, we'll have 40 within. Great. So I, I think we're really, it sounds like the first cohort went really well. And I think as long as my uh, committee agrees, we, we'd love to support this with a second cohort. <laughs> Moving on to. The PD for secondary math. There are actually two motions coming up for secondary math. The first one is an added day. Um, our 612 math department has been partnering with Stephanie Schwab of the MCIU. One of the things that we're really looking at is how to develop a backward designed framework for mathematics. And she has quite a bit of expertise. So she is going to meet, um, she's going to spend the day designing exemplar units. Um, and we're going to start with our sixth grade team. And then we're going to use those exemplar units as we move uh, the backward design writing through 12th grade. So th this is uh, having assistance from the IU for teachers to That's develop correct. curriculum. That's correct, and okay. that will occur um, at the end of this month. OK. Any comments or questions? So so we're developing new curriculum for math for 6 through? N no, no. We're, we're in the process of capturing our backward design work, and she's an expert in that area. And so using backward design, so we're in our we've third year of Carnegie. Um, and as we've come to understand it more, and that's just for the middle school, this is actually going to extend up through 12th grade, um, we have spent a good deal of time with pacing, and we think we have the pacing at the place where we need it. But now we really need to flesh out those documents. Uh, doing backward design work in mathematics is complex. We want that to be a living document, it's, and um, we want it to be something that guides teachers. So for example, as a sixth grade considers uh, 80 minute periods that needs to be part of the back design work and how that how that would look moving forward though the kinds of approaches to backward design um, that Ms. Schwab is going to support uh, our coordinator and the teachers in will be used as an exemplar to move through the rest of the grade levels um, Mrs. Kowalski feels very strongly that once we have this exemplar the rest of the work is kind of going to fall a little bit like dominoes, because we'll have the right pieces in place. Could you describe the second the <laughs> second one, and then we can? Yeah. So and actually, the now that so that that's for the remainder of this year, uh, Ms. Schwab is going to assist. She's done a great job. This year, she's worked with our 612 math department. Um, she's done some coaching. She's done coaching cycles. And there's been a very positive feedback cycle from the teachers for 2017-18, and you can see that's the next item. Um, we're requesting to have uh, Ms. Schwab come in again. We're um, going to have her do a little more coaching. So she coached um, particularly the sixth grade team this year and some high school teachers. We'd like to see her expanded in that role. Um, 
And I'm going to say in the same breath, if you turn the page, the next item is around science professional development, also for the 2017-18 school year with Mr. Jesse Gluckman. Um, we were lucky enough to have him this year. Uh, this spring, he started working with our science department. He also provided some professional development for Sandy Run teachers last Friday uh, around teaching in the extended period. We want to continue that relationship much like the mathematics relationship for our science teacher 612 next year. Um, so a little bit of a lower level, the, you can see the bottom line cost is a little bit less because he will just begin some coaching cycles with our science department teachers and then if we see that moving in a positive direction in the 18-19 school year, we could increase that a little bit more. So in terms of backward design, is the K to 5 science not quite complete or almost complete? We are finished. It finished. Is, it, it is, is complete. Finished. I couldn't remember. Yeah. So now it's really a matter of completing secondary. So secondary, and I think those of you who were present at the mm -hmm. curriculum summit, and I did include the slides, um, we're moving along um, in terms of 6-8 science. We should be, our, our big push for backward design completion is 2018. Um, sixth to eighth grade, I know sixth grade is complete, however, there's new consideration as the teachers who are very excited, they, our sixth grade science social studies team met with Jesse Gluckman on Friday morning to really start thinking about the approach to teaching science social studies. Because we have strong backward design units in sixth grade, <coughs> um, that work is going to go very, very well and they're, they're excited. Um, for seventh and eighth grade, we're nearing completion in science. Um, I think exciting to report is that our chemistry backward design, as well as common assessment, is almost complete. So we continue to push, and um, we are anticipating in most subject areas we will be complete. Obviously, it's a continuous review process by 2018. The professional development, though, that um, the MCIU is providing in mathematics and science isn't just backward design. Okay. It really is instruction. Um, we've done content reading, so it's a variety of things. The motion for the end of this year for mathematics is very specific to that, but all of the other work has been around deep, uh, rich math tasks and all kinds of important considerations in mathematics and will be as well in science. Okay. Yeah. Um, any comments or questions, or if not, um, we all agree to move these forward? Okay. Next on the agenda is conferences. Um, we don't really need to go through them. Does anybody have any questions about the conferences? Just, just the one that's late again. I think we need to continue to remind our coordinators that uh, <coughs> they need to submit these prior to the. We simply were processing the paperwork on that. I'm sorry. We were simply processing the paperwork as that came uh, in. Okay. I have, I have two questions. One is, um, there's one conference here listed for over two thousand dollars, which is more than most, and I see it's a week-long conference on a holiday week, and so. Lodging looks like the the dominant cost. Can we hear more about what that is? Mm -hmm. So the Future Business Leaders of America, which is a club at the high school, won a national level competition. And students will be, and it's quite an award. In fact, if you walk downstairs through the mathematics hallway, I think there's a giant banner and you can see the celebration of um, their achievement. That is the cost to send the advisor. Students cannot go without an advisor. Students will be paying their own travel costs, but so that is for... Um, this is the actual award ceremony. It it actually continues, and it's a further national level competition. Oh, okay. It's the competition at national level. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, there's a rather unusual one at the bottom of the list. We're sending two parents mm -hmm. um, to a conference. Can we hear more about that? So the... Uh, conference with the parents uh, is a Title I conference. And so uh, Title I federal programs, part of the responsibility is to um, have parents involved in the program be developed and then also provide professional development as a result. And so this conference is highly recommended as the one that we send parents to. We have done it in previous years. 
Um, I wasn't here, but it's my understanding that we have done it consistently in previous years to meet that federal requirement. The funding for it does come out of Title I monies, and then that family uh, will turn around and provide training to other Title I parents as a result. Okay. Thank you. Can I, can I just ask you to, re to remind me, uh, national conferences, we do not contribute any of the expense student expenses, because I, I know this one is quite expensive for our, and there's a lot of students attending. For air travel, um, there have been cases in the past, I believe, where we've split ground travel for local national conferences, but for air travel, we do not send students. Okay, how about their re then registrations for the students? Is that, are we covering that? I, I'll have to check for you. I'll have to check. Shouldn't that be a policy issue? Well, yeah, yeah, and I'm trying to just rem try to remember what that policy <laughs> issue is. National conferences, maybe Ms. Rothman. I actually can. did just read, recently read the policy because it's part of the field trip policy, and it is somewhat vague. It leaves yep. it leaves some room for individual situations. I know this particular event, which is a national and, and it's wonderful, and that's. I, I, I would encourage administration to at least look into or see what the policy has to say regarding at least the registration fees for that. Because we should be recognized and we should be honoring, we should we'd be, be very excited about that, but then you're paying for it. <laughs> and it is, and the FBLA is a wonderful opportunity for students, but I think I would also caution that it is an after-school activity. Mm -hmm. okay. It is not a direct result of our curriculum, and so I think that also bears on the conversation. Mm. Mm. It, that's not listed as one of the student activities, did we? Unless I'm missing it. The, it Was is it? At currently as a motion for students to go. Um, I will circle back, but I believe that we discussed it last Did time. Did we do Okay. And now this is the submission of Ms. Sundling's okay. um, participation in okay, the Okay, that, that could be. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, are, you, are you looking that up or should we keep moving? Uh, let's, let's move on to the student activities. Um, Do you want to just describe them briefly, please? So we begin with an event that occurred. Um, again, I should note that we are in the process of revamping our very antiquated, I think I can say that now, system that involves pieces of papers traveling across desks to approve things. Uh, I believe that there was a... I apologize. I should have asked that question now. Yeah, that's probably you probably should have saved it. This is more. This is probably more important. But um, and I believe the board was updated that this event occurred, and it should not take away from the honor that we had students again, um, that we sent through our music department <coughs> um, to all state to an all state competition, and two instructors are required to attend when students do that. And I believe, as a result, we had a very good outcome, and we um, have student recognitions to make in at least two areas. Uh, Mr. Levinowitz has probably memorized the instruments that were being played. I believe it was a clarinet and a... It might have been our double bass clarinet player, <laughs> which is a unique and probably an oboe or a bassoon player. It is... Um, but it's also French horn. I mean, Klugman... Dan, Dan Klugman usually attends many of these. It is remarkable that our students go um, all the way to states and then they achieve honors at the state level in all areas of our music um, department, including some students who have gone all the way to nationals. So it's much, much appreciated. And I would say and this is a direct result. By contrast to clubs, these competitions are a di direct result of opportunities that happen during the school day within our curriculum. Okay, and I guess there's two fifth grade trips. Yeah, so the next two are uh, the celebratory trips our fifth graders take. Each school determines where they go and they do different individual building-based things. And you can see Fort Washington 
is going to Baltimore while Thomas Fitz is going to New York City. And the last one is the uh, SGA yearly trip. So this one has a double star next to it because it was actually um, approved by motion and mm -hmm. there was a change in date and I believe that there is one fewer substitute teacher required with the new iteration. Okay, thank you. Um, did we find anything? So the answer is the policy is vague. Yes, it's we may the, the students may be required to pay the costs associated with trips. So we will revisit that. It's uh, 122 specifically. It's uh, extracurricular and co-curricular activities. It just says may be. Does yeah, it differentiate I, travel or registration fee or anything? Oh, it says everything. That um, I can give you that specifically here. It says. Um, okay. Well, yeah, it's uh, Administrative Regulation 122. I had it. Maybe we should let this go back to the policy committee rather than discussing it in more detail yep. here. I agree. Okay. So uh, are we comfortable with moving all of the rest of the items forward for the legislative meeting? Okay. Okay, at this point, um, I think we've covered, no, we haven't covered it. We have, I don't want to skip our technology motions. Mr. V, do you want to describe them? Uh, sure. These are our annual E-rate renewals with the MCIU and uh, our renewal of internet services with the MCIU. So E-rate essentially, um, we spend a little money to uh, get back a lot of money, a lot like you do with an accountant. And uh, the, our internet services, uh, we're gonna stay uh, with our current bandwidth level, although it is dropping in price. So uh, bandwidth has become less and less expensive through the MCIU, it's a good thing. Comments or questions? All right, thank you. Um, these are good things. We want to move them forward also. So I think that concludes our uh, discussion items, and we are ready for community input. If anyone would like to address Jen Kuznets, Fort Washington. This is about the schedule um, for the elementary school level. I've seen a draft, I know it's a draft, um, but still on the draft, second recess is um, on like off of the grades three, four, and five. So as this draft is, I think even today's latest draft had no second recess for grades three, four, and five. So my question is, we have the longest school day of all our surrounding districts. <coughs> I know we're trying to fit in RTII, which I think is great, but I'm not understanding how we can't fit it in to our day when we have the longest day. We're 25 minutes longer than Wissahickon. Wissahickon has RTII. So even if you argue they don't have a second recess, they're 25 minutes shorter of a day than we are. So I just, I guess, is it because ReadyGen and Eureka are such difficult programs to teach that we need such long blocks, like 120 minutes of instructional time for ReadyGen? not understanding how we can't fit it in. Is it, and then my other question would be, if we did hire, I know we can probably implement RTII without hiring additional staff, but if we did hire additional staff, would that alleviate the scheduling issues of second recess? I guess is my other question. Hi, um, I'm Jamie Picker. I'm a mother of two children who go to Fort Washington Elementary School. I spoke a couple months ago um, about the topic of the second recess and the schedule for next year, and I'm going to continue to talk, um, but I also did have a chance to look at the new schedule for next year. Um, my son's in third grade right now, so next year he'll be in fourth grade. And quickly when I looked over it, I saw that 
They have 75 minutes of math followed directly by this new 30 minutes of RTI, followed directly by another 60 minutes of science and social studies. So that's a huge chunk of time, academic time, with no break at all. Um, I'm also, personally, I'm a speech and language pathologist in a neighboring district that's ranked most of the time number one or number two in the state. Um, I've been at both the elementary school and middle school. I'm currently in the middle school. Um, so both professionally and personally, um, these kids can't concentrate for that long period of time without a break. And the studies show that these brain breaks that they give, I know my son's teacher uses it now, they're great, but they're not um, to replace outdoor play and for them to get outside. Um, I quoted a lot of the research last time, but just saying that um, a student's ability to refocus cognitively has shown to be stimulated more by the break from the classroom by than by the mode of activity that occurred during the break. In other words, kids need to get out of the classroom and play. Um, we need to look at the emotional, the social well-being of these children. I work in um, middle school, and I've been following all the transitions recently from fifth to sixth, and these children, so many children are coming up with emotional issues and psychological issues, and giving them more academic time without breaks is not going to help bridge the achievement gap. Hi, um, my name is Katie Riley and I'm from Fort Washington. I just had two questions. I was wondering in regards to the new kindergarten um, assessment slash schedule process, if the classrooms will be established before assessments and before any face-to-face -face meetings with the students. And then secondly, I was wondering um, these coffee conversations, when the times will be announced and how are we advertising them to make sure that uh, enough people in the community have enough time to plan to attend. That's all. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening. I'm Amy Francic. I'm from the Jarrettown Sending Area. Um, I, too, am a speech pathologist from another district. Speeches are out tonight. Um, my feedback is, is slightly different. I absolutely agree that gross motor activities, sensory motor activities during the day are critical to help our students attend, focus, and function very well. Um, in our district, we do it slightly differently um, in terms of not just brain breaks, but providing real integrated activities that are gross motor in nature, are heavy work in nature, sensory motor in nature in the classroom. And I would just encourage the district to consider taking some time to collaborate with the occupational therapists and physical therapists in the district currently to integrate more of their practices potentially into the classroom. Um, I don't know that there isn't a way to integrate the physical activities and the curricular materials together. That's really what we're doing um, where I am right now. Um, and I think there may be a compromised position because I think activity is critical, um, but I also think the academic rigor is also critical. So just a, a bit of food for thought. Ginny Vitella, Ambler. I'll say that with so many Fort Washington people here. Um, OK, I guess, I'll, I, I guess uh, my questions are, <laughs> um, I'm confused about the math. Because you, I believe, and I'm, I might be hearing it wrong, so if we tear everybody out, we have four elementary schools, and we tear everybody out, and it roughly, Four, one teacher, a specialist for the third level, I guess, would have four kids. One teacher would have six kids. And that remains, for most schools, about, there's about 80 kids in each grade level, roughly. I know it goes up and down, but we'll say 80. That means that 70 other kids split between three different teachers. So is that for that two-hour RTI or that two-hour ELA time, are they with 23 kids in their class while the other kids are pulled out? Or is it RTI half an hour of the whole RTI time? I'm, I'm confused about the math, how we can do that with the teachers. And then the average kids and the advanced kids, will say, are then in a class for 23 kids for two hours a day for ELA. So maybe my math's wrong. I don't know. Um, and also, when, when we approved ReadyGen, I thought one of the great thing about it, I thought was one of the sales pitches, was that it did provide leveling. So that the books, since everybody had their own book, that there was going to be a leveling situation with those books. And so now I'm confused that it isn't 
So can someone clarify that to me? I mean, I, I, I swear that was one of the reasons why we picked that one, even though it didn't have phonics. <laughs> um, also, so the junior great books, are these entirely different set of books than the ready gen books? So again, I'm confused. So is my child reading a ready gen book during ELA and then a junior great book during RTI? And then I, I, it sounds very confusing to me. And I, I, I don't know how a kindergarten or first grader is going to understand it. And then the teachers, again, still under, trying to understand ready gen, I think, to Sarah's point. So I don't understand how this seems to not, it, we're not using the ready gen books. We're using different books for RTI, right? Um, and then there was the guiding reading, and I, I guess I'm confused about what books are reading when, and who's in what classes at what time. Um, also, uh, I'm wondering with the new schedule, is there any free time so that the principals and or the teachers, knowing their class, knowing their kids, can shuffle things around? So if there's 30 minutes a day that that teacher has to do what they want to do. Um, also, um, the gifted review committee, I was just curious who's on that and what's, what's involved with, what is going on with that? I don't really understand what that is. Is that different than the excellence and equity committee that's for gifted kids? I don't know. Um, and also, I see that we have a new program for ELA, foundations, all these other things, STAR, Eureka, science, and I don't hear anything about social studies, so just curious when that's coming down the pike, if at all. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. OK. I don't see anyone else coming up to speak, so we will address some of these questions. Um, Dr. Miner. I will work through my notes. I was trying to type as quickly as I could, so if I missed anything, please let me know. Um, there was uh, the comment regarding second recess in grades three, four, and five, um, and the fact that it wasn't in the previous draft of the schedule and it was not in the draft of the schedule released today. Um, that is correct. It is not in either draft of the schedule. Um, at this point, um, that may still be something that we um, choose to put in the schedule. One of the conversations that we had this evening was um, that one of the things that we want to do when we go out to the parent coffees is get clarity around um, parents' feelings and the difference between the length of time for recess and lunch versus the number of recess opportunities. So uh, I, I believe uh, that that particular speaker referenced the length of our day and that Wissahickon uh, is 25 minutes shorter than uh, Upper Dublin's day. And that is correct. Um, also, Wissahickon has 15 minutes of recess uh, in grade and 15 minutes of lunch in grades kindergarten through fifth grade, one recess per day. Um, so they do address that time uh, very differently than we do. Um, in our current draft of the schedule, we do have two recesses in K1 and 2, but we don't have the um, one in 3, 4, and 5 at this time. At this time, however, we do have 25 minutes for recess and 25 minutes for lunch. There had been some feedback from parents um, regarding children's ability to fully eat their lunch and converse with uh, their peers. So we're continuing to have that conversation at this point. The question about whether or not additional staff would alleviate the scheduling issues of second recess, there really aren't um, any scheduling issues in terms of staff with second recess. At this point, um, it's <coughs> philosophical and about time on task. One of the things that um, I asked the members of the committee to do uh, was to, on their own, uh, and I will do it as well, seek out other districts in the state that may have a second recess in grades three, four, and five. Uh, at this point, I am not aware of any. Um, there are a few districts in the area that have a second recess in grades K1 and 2. Um, and we've also talked about the transition into middle school um, where there is no recess in sixth grade. Um, and so all of those things continue to be topics for conversation, and we'll continue to listen to parent feedback as we go out to the coffee. So it's much more about uh, time on task in the content areas um, than uh, anything else. The other issue, um, 
and I think why the, the committee has favored a longer recess than a second recess is that a second recess is not just the time outside, but it's the transition to and from the time outside that is lost. And so again, I think that'll be an important conversation to continue. Um, as far as the coffees being announced so that parents can plan ahead, uh, Mr. Alston and Mr. McAleer are hosting those coffees. Um, I am not sure uh, what the status is in terms of their sending invites out, but they have been asked to invite not only their school community, but to share the invites with their fellow principals so that they can get out to parents as a whole. So uh, perhaps one of them, when I'm done, can, can talk about what the status is of those going out, but they are um, uh, with much gratitude for me handling the invitations. Um, there was a comment about uh, integrating and collaborating with OT and PT into the classroom to integrate physical activities uh, into the curricular day. My position just prior to coming to Upper Dublin was as director of pupil services where I oversaw the OTs and PTs. Um, so I'm very familiar with this type of work and I think it's an, an excellent uh, approach um, both in terms of having uh, OTs and PTs provide um, preventative kind of activities for students with potential OT and PT needs but also to consult with teachers about um, integrated physical activity. We have talked and, and one of the principals uh, mentioned this evening that one of the things that we fully uh, anticipate that our teachers will do and encourage them to do is in fact to integrate physical activity. So for instance, um, you know, going outside uh, on a nice day and doing a walk and talk about a book, um, going out and measuring a field to do a geometry lesson. We certainly want as much physical activity um, as can be integrated into the day. And one of the things that I was remiss in not mentioning earlier that had come up as a comment from parents um, in the work group meeting was the length of the ELA block that seems to be of concern. And um, I just wanted to offer some clarity around that. So the ELA block shows up on the schedules as 120 minutes. And the reason for that is so that teachers do in fact have that flexibility to use that time um, how they see fit. ReadyGen itself calls for um, 30 minutes of writing, 30 minutes of whole group instruction, and 60 minutes of small group. We didn't want to break that out in the schedule because we didn't want to restrain teachers on a day-to-day -day basis to that. We wanted to give them flexibility. Um, and so we want to make sure um, that parents understand that those are three distinct activities that involve different placements of kids in terms of physical placement on the carpet or at a table um, and very different activities, but we're showing it as a block for that purpose of giving teachers the flexibility to use the time as they think best appropriate. In terms of ReadyGen providing leveling, that is accurate. ReadyGen provides leveled texts. It also provides uh, an intervention component within the program called <laughs> ReadyUp. And so there is the ability to differentiate within a classroom. And if you remember in my presentation talking about the two eyes, the eye of instruction and the eye of intervention, the eye of instruction is handled by that leveling of those ReadyGen books in the classroom. And to some extent can be um, facilitated with the ReadyUp materials. However, uh, more intense interventions do require programming beyond the ReadyGen um, capabilities. As far as the um, junior grade books and it's not being ReadyGen books, that's correct. They are different. Um, everybody is getting ReadyGen. So 100% of kids are getting ReadyGen in their core classroom. That is separate and distinct from RTI time. So again, if you recall my slide, it talked about ReadyGen plus enrichment for growth with the junior grade books, ReadyGen plus intervention for growth um, with LLI and with text type. So this is separate and distinct from um, the ReadyGen program, which is our core program. Um, is there any flexibility to shuffle things around? Again, within those blocks, one of the questions that teachers have raised, for instance, is when could we go to the computer lab? And of course, if you're um, using Zern, for instance, you can go to the computer lab, and that's part of your math instruction. You know, the, you can go to the computer lab for reading eggs, all those kinds of um, 
RAS kids those programs during your ELA block. So in terms of teachers' abilities to go and do other things, they, those are there, but we fundamentally want uh, that type of instruction to happen again for all the reasons that I mentioned previously. In terms of the Gifted Review Committee, who is on that and what does it do? Uh, the Gifted Review Committee was established, I believe, last year. Mm -hmm. Yes, last year um, when Mrs. Clegg um, was overseeing Gifted. It was then transferred to uh, Dr. Gretzula. And then um, when I took over that position, I took over the committee. So it is a group of parents, um, administrators, and teachers who are looking at the current practices regarding gifted education in the district. And as I mentioned previously, we'll have a report to share um, on May 30th in terms of recommendations for future actions for the district around gifted. And then the final one that I have written down is um, what's going on with social studies. Um, social studies is near and dear to my heart. I was a high school social studies teacher when I taught. Um, and so I'm very cognizant that that is a program that we have not reviewed uh, in recent history. However, there, as was mentioned, many other things that have been um, uh, reviewed and revised recently. And so I hope to look at social studies um, next spring and talk and begin the conversation of where we're going to go with that, um, you know, particularly looking at civics and some of the other pieces that are important to get integrated into an elementary education. At this point, we have the existing social studies curriculum, and we're fortunate that ReadyGen um, is rich in both science and social studies content, but certainly uh, at some point we do need to tackle uh, revisions to social studies, but I, I think that we have a, a lot going on right now, and so that's one that I have consciously chosen to um, put off till a later time. I mean, you, you sort of answered one of the questions about free time in the schedule with with the discussion of flexibility within the ReadyGen block. Um, I, I know I've heard in other discussions some some things about teacher discretion. If, if we stay with one recess for three, four, and five at the end of the, the process this month, um, I know I've heard some discussion of teacher discretion with regard to additional breaks. Yes, thank you for actually mentioning that. In both the previous draft and the current draft of the schedule, and this was at a specific parent request, we have in fact a notation that says that teachers in grade three, four, and five may provide additional recess at their discretion. Um, in fact, this is um, what I am familiar with in other districts and I believe happens in districts across the state where there's not a scheduled uh, second recess in grades three, four, and five. It is also what has been happening at Maple Glen for the last six years. And so I know that some parents have raised concerns that um, it won't happen if it's not scheduled, that if it's not on a rotational basis, teachers won't do it, that teachers, if their PBOS scores are different than other teachers, they'll be criticized for a lack of recess. Um, all of those um, are understandable concerns, but I would say that we have a model right here in Upper Dublin at Maple Glen for the last six years where uh, second recess has been at the discretion of teachers in grades three, four, and five. And to my knowledge, none of those issues have come up as a concern, either in terms of penalizing teachers or teachers um, not doing that in a way that was um, acceptable to both parents um, and students. So when I did have the coffee at Maple Glen, we talked about that. Um, there was a good turnout at that coffee. It was, uh, to, I believe, all Maple Glen parents, and they all um, seemed satisfied with how that um, has been managed there. So we do have an in-district model of that discretionary opportunity for additional recess. I, I would like to s just um, say one more thing about it in terms of philosophy. Um, having it be discretionary allows for two things. One, it allows for teachers to really read um, their students' needs in the moment and determine when a break is, is necessary and appropriate. And two, it also puts that um, control back in the hands of teachers so that if they, for instance, are engaged in a science experiment and it's going really well, they don't have to drop everything and go outside for recess. They can say, you know what, we're going to keep going with a science experiment today. And so the teachers at Maple Glen have expressed that they really do appreciate having that flexibility both to respond in real time to the needs that they see of their students for a break and also to not feel 
uh, bound to drop something that's going well because suddenly the clock says it's time for a recess. Okay, thank you. Uh, do either of our, any of our elementary principals want to speak to the coffees or publicizing? All right, so um, I'll just say this on, on the microphone is that there is a listserv going out with regard to the coffees and that's one of the ways that it's getting publicized. I just, I, one of the questions that was brought up, and I, I don't think it was addressed, but um, was that in the RTII situation, that's when we're going to have these tiers classes. It's not during the regular ready oh, right. gen. And the, say 80% of our kids are tier one. Um, what would those class size look like during those times? Thank you. I, did, I didn't forget to write that one down. Um, so... The math on that is that at any given grade level, you are taking the teachers that are available at that grade level plus the reading specialists that are available at that grade level. And depending on, as I talked about earlier, the hot spots, potentially a special education teacher. So when you're saying you're taking out four kids, that, that would go to one reading specialist, four kids would go to another reading specialist. Um, you know, six kids might go to a special education teacher. And so um, the reshuffling that occurs for the most part will be pretty much the same as class sizes are. Any difference in that would only impact that half hour of RTI time. The two hours of ready gen time has, is not impacted in any way by RTI, and so the numbers for that are the regularly established class size numbers. Thank you. There was a kindergarten. Can you remind me oh, what the kindergarten uh, question was? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. The, ki the kindergarten assessment process. So the kindergarten assessment process um, is that we are collecting information on kindergartners right now. Um, I think the question was about where, what in what order did screening kindergartners happen. Um, for kindergartners for whom we don't have sufficient information, um, we can have, we'll have reading specialists and or kindergarten teachers um, do assessments. The primary purpose there is to um, look for students who may have outlier type needs, um, extreme giftedness, uh, a learning um, concern, uh, extreme anxiety, those types of things. The building principals um, are going to work together um, with uh, Meredith Penner and Kathy Smythe and I um, in June to establish class lists based on that information. And then when the students come to school in September, they will be screened both through the STAR Early Literacy Assessment and then also all of the pieces of our regular kindergarten assessments that are not covered by um, STAR Early Literacy. So for instance, the ability to write their name, the ability to form letters. You can't see that um, through an online uh, computer assessment. So those pieces of our currently existing assessments will continue to be utilized by our kindergarten teachers um, so that they can uh, deliver instruction and monitor students' progress throughout the year. So I think uh, another part of the question was, will classroom assignments be set before our teachers yes. do their assessments? Yes. In the current, the current methodology, uh, our teachers see them, but it may not be the teacher who would have that student. That is correct. So in our current methodology, our kindergarten students don't come to school until the fourth day of school. Um, kindergarten teachers see whichever students are assigned to them, not necessarily the students that they will get. They conduct an assessment, and then they uh, make class lists at that time. Um, I think that is pretty atypical. Again, I, uh, typically students are assigned to, to teachers before the school year starts in all grade levels, uh, so the parents have an awareness of where their child is going. Um, and so we will uh, assign students to classes. In terms of um, any concerns that anybody might have that we won't know enough information to do that, um, you know, there's typically three to four kindergarten classes in any building. Um, we don't 
teach different content to any child in any of those classes. The only purpose of doing an advanced screening is to try to make sure that there's heterogeneity in the classes. Um, however, uh, kindergartners, a giant proportion of their lives uh, happens every week, right? They're very, very young. And so kindergartners change more than any other kids change. And so a kindergartner who may uh, know none of their letters on day one of kindergarten may know all of them by day 30. You know, they really, the the growth in kindergartners is, is quite astounding. And so it's always um, your best guess in terms of making heterogeneous groups. And, and the other thing I would add is, of course, kids move in. Kids move in in September, October, November, um, and they're put into classrooms. So fundamentally, the instruction is, is identical in all classes. It's really just looking for... Um, heterogeneity to the extent that we can get it, and uh, a not uncommon practice, and in fact, um, the practice that I'm most familiar with is simply to take pink and blue cards and just go pink card, blue card, pink card, blue card into classes, which statistically gets you heterogeneous classes. So that, um, that could also be a methodology, but we're choosing to get additional information to try to support us in doing that work. Okay, uh, anything else we didn't address that anybody noted? Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, we are now adjourned. The next, oh, I should tell you when the next meeting is. The next meeting is actually on a Tuesday, so it is Tuesday, May 30th, the day after Memorial Day. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And, and just an announcement, the board will adjourn to an executive session.